Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Pastor Chad Cummings uh, from my home office, and uh, this evening we're going to be uh, taking our Wednesday night class in a little bit of a different direction. Uh, this evening we canceled our services because of the ice that we've been getting, and uh, so therefore I thought, you know what, uh, I've already got this great lesson planned, and uh, we're going to be talking about a key Puritan figure, and I really don't want to miss out on that. I don't want you to miss out on that. So I thought, you know what, what better way to do it than from the comfort of my home office. So uh, let me uh, let me take care of a little... Uh, technology issue here and get uh, get this shared on Facebook here so that others can uh, participate in this and then we'll jump into our lesson this evening on so Facebook here so that others can uh, participate in this and then we'll jump into our lesson this evening so Facebook here so that all right almost there. And, uh, and one more real quick here, almost there. Okay, I think we're good to go. Um, so once again, uh, Pastor Chad um, from my home office here out in my garage. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorite places to be. Uh, it's quiet, uh, surrounded by lots of books, um, and, and also Emma's with me this evening. Emma, come here. Come here. Say hi to everybody. I don't know if you can see her or not. She's, she's down here. She's got her sweater on, so, you know, it's winter, so everybody needs a sweater. Good girl. Go lay down. Go lay down. Come on. So this evening, um, our Wednesday night adult class has been focusing on a historical theological approach uh, and specifically within the context of the Puritans. So we've spent several months just looking at uh, the overall history of the Puritan movement uh, and then we've taken several weeks here, um, actually more like several months, and have honed in on specific Puritan leaders. Um, most of them were pastors. Um, a couple of them, like uh, John Bunyan, was a layman, um, although he preached and, and ministered uh, to, um, you know, tons of people. So, um, but most of these figures that we've been studying are, are Puritan pastors. Um, and tonight we come to an individual by the name of John Flavel. Um, John Flavel is probably one of the lesser known Puritan leaders, um, especially considering, you know, other Puritan leaders that were named John. John was a popular name. So you've got Jonathan Edwards, John Owen, uh, John Bunyan, you know, lots of Johns that are well known. But John Flavel is maybe not as well known as, as others. So hopefully this evening it'll be a, uh, enlightening as, as well as encouraging for you because John Flavel has a great legacy to leave us. Um, but before we jump into it, let's pray real quick. Father, we just thank you for your grace in our lives. God, we thank you for your encouragement. Father, we thank you for the word of God that leads us, guides us, directs us. And uh, Father, we pray that this evening that uh, John Flavel, um, one of these great uh, members of the great cloud of witnesses that you have given to the church to be an inspiration, to be an example. Father, I pray that we would learn from his life, and Father, that uh, you would encourage us through his ministry and his legacy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So John Flavel lived, uh, was born somewhere around the year of 1628. The you know, they don't know for sure exactly what year he was born. There's some conflicting stories here. Um, but uh, most scholars settle in on 1628 as the year that he was born. Uh, he died in 1691. Um, he was born in uh, Bromsgrove, Worcestershire. <laughs> That's a tough word to say. Uh, Worcestershire, right? Worcestershire sauce. 
Um, so he was born there uh, to Richard Flavel, who was also a Puritan minister. So he was kind of born into this Puritan movement. Um, in 1650, he was ordained by the Presbytery at Salisbury uh, and became the pastor of a fairly wealthy congregation in the town of Diptford. Um, this was his first pastorate, and, uh, and it was a fairly successful pastorate, but he didn't stay there very long. Um, as we'll get to here in a moment. But then in 1655, about five years later, uh, Flavel's first wife and child die in childbirth. Um, so tragedy hits him very early on uh, during his first pastorate here, and, uh, and uh, pretty, pretty tough. Um, in 1656, he accepts a call to minister at the seaport of Dartmouth. So he only stays in Dipford, you know, about five, six years, uh, and then receives another call to a seaport town called Dartmouth, uh, which he accepts. Uh, in 1662, the Act of Uniformity is passed. Uh, we've talked about this in the past. Um, the The Act of Uniformity was was basically this this um, decree from the King of England, which would have been King Charles II at this time. Uh, but it was his decree to try to bring um, all of Christianity in England and Scotland under the same banner, which was the banner of the Church of England. Uh, the Church of England, its history, uh, broke off from Roman Catholicism and essentially was Catholicism without the Pope. Uh, King Henry VIII in the 1500s wanted to divorce his wife. Uh, the Pope would not grant him that, so he says, fine, we'll create our own organization and we'll call it the Church of England and I'll establish myself as the leader of it. So basically you have Roman Catholicism without the Pope. Instead of the Pope, you have the King of England who is overseeing the whole, uh, the whole church. Um, but within this, you have the Puritans, right? The Puritans are the ones who are wanting to see the Reformation, which began with Martin Luther, John Calvin, William Tyndale, John Knox, these, these key Reformation leaders. The Puritans wanted to see that fulfilled in a greater extent in the churches. Um, and oftentimes they found themselves butting heads with the Church of England because Church of England still had these uh, these Catholic uh, roots to them. You know that they kind of you know they followed liturgies and they followed the same you know dressing and the same garments that the you know Roman priests would wear and those sorts of things. But the Puritans they they bucked against all of that, um, and so King Charles comes along. And he says, you know what, we're going to pass this act of uniformity in which we're going to require any minister to, to conform to the Book of Common Prayer. So the Common Prayer um, dictated how churches should operate, um, how ministers should operate, you know, um, right down to what kind of clothing they should wear, you know, the, the robes and the hat and the, you know, the weird, the weird things, um, uh, you know, down to how baptism should be administered. All these sorts of things were contained within the Book of Common Prayer. But the Puritans saw this and they smelled a rat. And that rat was Catholicism dressed in the Church of England garb. And so they, they absolutely refused to conform to the act of uniformity. Um, and so as a result, in England alone, around 2,000 Puritan pastors were ejected or kicked out of their pulpits. Um, John Flavel was one of those. Uh, so he is ministering in Dartmouth. King Charles passes the Act of Uniformity, um, and as a result, Flavel loses his pastorate, loses his church. But the interesting thing about Flavel was he continued to minister to his people in the secret, right? And, and actually, a lot of Puritans did this, um, but Flavel became somewhat famous or infamous for his secret activities with his former congregation. Um, and so this continued on for several years. This was 1662. 1665, King Charles obviously realizes that the Puritans aren't just going to go quietly away into the night. They're not going to just give up, right? They're continuing to minister to their congregations in secret. Uh, so he passes another law called the Five Mile Act. And what this did is that it, it uh, prevented or forced any former minister 
to who wouldn't conform to the act of uniformity to to not live within five miles of their previous church. So, for instance, if this were to happen today, and say you know uh, you know government passed a, an act of uniformity, uh, you know, and and if I were you know not compliant with that and lost my church because of that, well, then another law came into effect saying, well, you know what, you can't even live within five miles of your church because we're afraid you're going to keep influencing that congregation, which the Puritans were. Um, so, you know, um, so Flavel once again fell under this same act, um, and he moves to a little town called Slapton, which was about six miles away from Dartmouth, right? So it's a five-mile act. Uh, Flavel, you can't live within five miles of Dartmouth. So what's he do? He moves six miles away and, as you can probably guess, continues to minister to his people secretly, <laughs> right? He's just not going to give up. Uh, just love his tenacity. So then along it comes uh, in 1672, um, another act, another law that's put into effect, but it's in a positive sense. It's called the Declaration of Indulgence, and it's passed giving nonconformists, the Puritans, giving them the freedom to worship publicly, and this therefore allowed Flavel to publicly return to Dartmouth and begin ministering again. So, um, so a little bit of a bright light. In this, in this declaration of indulgence. But the interesting thing, it only lasts for, an ear, for a year. A year later, in 1673, the declaration is rescinded by the government. And uh, so Flavel once again continues to minister, but in secret. And, uh, and it was also during this time that tragedy struck again, and Flavel loses his second wife. So he's, he's widowed twice now, and that's in 1673. In 1682, uh, just because of the, the pressure and the threat from authorities and, and Flavel is, um, you know, he's getting a name for himself as being this nonconformist, but, you know, he's still continuing to minister to his people. And um, so in 1682, under pressure, he is forced to go to London for safety, um, right? So hopefully he can disappear in a bigger city. And, uh, but... Once again, he continues to minister secretly, this time in a friend's church in London. 1684, he returns to Dartmouth where his ministry is confined to his home. Um, so, so the laws are getting a little bit looser. He's allowed to go back home, uh, but as he goes there, they confine him, they place him under house arrest. He's not allowed to leave his home. Um, and also during this time, Tragedy strikes a third time, and he loses his... 1687, another indulgence is passed, uh, allowing Flavel to publicly preach again. So he's no longer under house arrest. Uh, he has persevered through many, many different... So what has he left us today? What kind of a legacy has he left us? Well, several things. First of all, although from our modern perspective, we might think that he's, he's lesser known, but among his peers, among the Puritans, or reference. Uh, so Edwards, uh, who's very, very well known, um, you know, part of his root comes from the teaching of John Flavel. Um, George Whitfield, also a uh, key leader in the Great Awakening in America. They say that George Whitfield took Flavel's writings to America with him and often read them as inspiration uh, while he is, you know, evangelizing and preaching around America. So George Whitfield, so these are, I mean, these are big people. And they're pointing back to Flavel saying, this guy influenced us tremendously. So that should cause us to wake up a little bit and say, okay, who is this guy? This might be somebody I need to learn more about. And, uh, and I think that's the case. His writings, a person who was very much um, in connection with his ministry, although we don't know who it is, um, left this anonymous message, and once again, it's contained in here. This is where I got it from. But, uh, but this anonymous person says this about Flavel's preaching. He says, I could say much, though not enough, of the excellency of Flavel's preaching, of his seasonable, suitable, and spiritual matter, of his plain expositions of Scripture, his taking method, his genuine and natural deductions, his convincing arguments, 
his clear and powerful demonstrations, his heart-searching applications, and his comfortable supports to those that were afflicted in conscience. In short, that person must have a very soft head or a very hard heart, or both, that could sit under his ministry unaffected. Right, so this guy thought very highly of Flavel, although we don't know who it is. Um, but boy, he just he just spells it all out. This guy knew how to preach, right, and preach biblically, right? It isn't just he wasn't just full of hot air. I mean, this is scripture. This is Bible based preaching, and uh, in fact, he says a person would have to have either a very soft head or a very hard heart to not be affected by Flavel's ministry. So. So amongst his peers, Flavel was very well respected. But along with that, Flavel had a reputation of being very powerful in prayer. Uh, in fact, many people said about him that he never seemed to not know what to pray about or how to pray, or what words to use. You know, we've probably all been in that situation where, you know, we're asked to pray for somebody, or pray over a situation, or pray at dinner, or whatever it might be, and it's just like, okay, uh, Lord, first I need to pray that you give me the words, right? Because I don't know what to say, I don't know how to pray. They say with Flavel, he always had something to say in his prayers. Um, and not only that, but his, his prayers were effective. There's a story told that he was on a on a boat in a journey, and along that along the way, um, they came into a big storm, right? Stormy seas, and and the captain comes along and says, "We're going down. Everybody, start praying. Uh, you know, the ship is going down. We're done." And so the story is, is that Flavel tried to grab as many people as possible, bring them into his cabin, and start praying that this storm would go away. But Flavel, in his journal, says, we were being tossed around by the sea so badly that we couldn't pray. I mean, people were being knocked against the walls, and so you can just imagine the violence of this storm. And, uh, and so Flavel says that eventually he got a hold of a post, grabs onto it, prays with all of his might for the waters and the storm to cease and be still, similar to how Jesus prayed in the Gospels. And just a matter of moments later, the exactly same thing happened. The storm stopped, the winds stopped, and the sun came out, and, and everybody was like, that was just a miracle. And uh, But a lot of people on that boat pointed to Flavel's prayer as being the instrumental tool that God used to, uh, to save them. So, so he was very well known as being uh, somebody powerful in prayer, in his prayer life. But maybe the biggest thing about his life, and, uh, and we see this in all the Puritans, is their perseverance. Right? Um, especially here with Flavel, because we get so many... Um, we get so many examples of his persecution and, and the, the tragedies that he lived through, but yet he persevered. He kept on going despite opposition. Um, and a lot of sacrifice that he made along the way just so his people could be ministered to. I mean, talk about a faithful shepherd. I mean, this guy is a great example. Um, so let me give you a few of those examples. First of all, as I mentioned earlier in the timeline, he was born into a Puritan family. Uh, his father was a Puritan minister, and, and his mother was also of Puritan roots. Um, and so therefore, he was, he was born essentially into a persecuted life. Um, his parents would eventually be condemned as, as criminals for being nonconformists, right? I mean, they wouldn't conform to the uh, uh, King Charles's act of uniformity, so they, they became outlaws in a sense. Um, and they were eventually arrested, but instead of being, um, uh, you know, they were, they, were, they were just malicious against some of these people. Um, so instead of, you know, just outright killing them, they sent them to a town where it was well known that the plague existed and had them imprisoned in this town. And as a result, Flavel's parents caught the plague and died. Um, it was almost a form of, of, uh, of torture, you know, die. Um, I mean, it's just, it's malicious. It's just, it's ugly. Um, so, so Flavel lived through that, you know, watching his parents' congregation in Dipford. 
but yet he felt in his heart, he felt the call of the Lord that he would be more beneficial to the kingdom in Dartmouth. And so he accepted the sacrifice and moved on uh, with a big pay cut. <laughs> so so we, it's just, he's just that kind of a person, right? I mean, those are the kind of people we need to elevate. And, you know, not these people that are greedy, these pastors that just do everything for the love of money. And, that, you know, um, this is a guy we want to uh, look to for an example. Um, but along with that, during his time of persecution brought on by the act of uniformity, he continued to meet with his church underground, as I've mentioned, um, you know, how he met with them secretly. Um, there's just some crazy stories that came out of this. For example, uh, once he even dressed up as a woman on horseback in order to get by the authorities on his way to a meeting where he was supposed to preach. Right, so um, so he's on this road, and I don't know if they you know caught wind that he was coming through this town or whatever to get to his meeting place where he was supposed to preach. Um, but anyway, they set up authorities that were going to you know check everybody that came along and to prevent him from preaching. Um, so he dresses up as as a lady, and uh, and they don't suspect a thing, and he goes on through, goes to the meeting, and preaches the service. You know, um, another time, another interesting story. Um, there was evidently in this area where he lived, um, Dartmouth, Slapton, kind of on the south of England there, um, there was a, a rock formation that went out into the ocean, and at low tide, it was exposed, right? And so it made like this walkway out to this bigger rock formation, and so what would happen is, is that some of these nonconformists would hold service out on this big rock formation out in the ocean. Um, you know, and then when the tide would come up, you know, nobody could get out to them in a sense because this, this, you know, this, this trail, this rock trail formation uh, would be underwater. And then when the tide would go down, then they'd be able to go back to land and that sort of thing. Um, and this became like a really famous place for Puritans to meet and have services um, and avoid the authorities from, you know, catching up to them. Well, one day they say that the authorities were chasing Flavel and he went out on this rock formation on his horse and to escape the authorities that are chasing him, he drove his horse off of that rock formation into the ocean and swam away to safety and they never got him. Um, but it was that kind of persecution. They, they did not like this guy. This guy was everything that they wanted to destroy. Um, but he persevered. He kept on going. And some of these stories are just really pretty incredible. Um, then we have, you know, uh, his life after the Five Mile Act, right? So uh, Five Mile Act is passed. Flavel, you cannot live within five miles of Dartmouth anymore. So he moves six miles to Slapton and began holding secret meetings out in the woods, so great big forest there, and uh, and so they would have secret meetings, church meetings, um, baptisms. Uh, they would hold communion, all these sorts of things out in the woods. Well, sometimes the authorities would catch up with them. Uh, no matter how well they tried to hide, you know, uh, somebody would, would rat them out or whatever, and uh, they'd be discovered. Well, one story goes that one night while Flavel is in the middle of preaching to a group of his people out in the woods that the authorities show up, and several of the people are arrested, and they were fined and, and whatnot. But Flavel escapes, along with several other people that were in that meeting there. And they take him to another part of the forest, and he, and he picks up and preaches the rest of his sermon where he was you know, interrupted from. Uh, so he just, they just did not give up. Uh, and boy, how badly do we need that in the church today? You know, we, I mean, we give up so easily for so many things, um, but they realize that the gospel of Jesus Christ um, should never be given up, right? I mean, so anyway, um, along with that, um, in 1684, he is allowed to return to Dartmouth, but was placed under house arrest, as I mentioned. And, um, and uh, as a result of this, his popularity, um, as a result of all of this, a lot of people would skip the government-sanctioned 
services of the Church of England and secretly come to his meetings, right? So um, uh, they even say that the mayor was missing from the Church of England services for like three or four weeks and come to find out he was secretly attending Flavel's services. <laughs> and uh, so he just caused a big you know, uproar and disruption and all of this. Um, then we find at the end of Flavel's life in the city of Dartmouth um, that you know, even though he is allowed to publicly preach and minister again, um, there's still there's still a, a nucleus of people that are just opposed to him. And they say that towards the end of his life, they even at one point made up this kind of scarecrow that, that kind of looked like him, right? This mannequin of sorts, and they burnt it in the town square. You know, um, just just opposition, it seems, at every step of the way, whether it's from, from the Church of England, whether it's from, you know, people in his local community, whether it's through, um, you know, death and the loss of his, of his wives or children. Um, it just seemed like it, constant opposition and sacrifice, but yet he persevered through all of it. Um, and, and that is the key word. I, if I haven't said it enough already, that is the key word of his life is perseverance. Um, so very, very encouraging. Um, so we asked the question, right? What in the world would inspire somebody to persevere like this? Right? I mean, why not just give up? Why not go find a nice quiet place along the sea, uh, live a quiet life? Um, why live like this? Why, why um, face persecution? Why face threat of death? Why face threat of imprisonment? Why, uh, you know, why, what would inspire somebody to live like this? And uh, we get this, just a glimpse of it, from his personal journal in which he writes this. To make sure of eternal life is the great business which the sons of death have to do in this world. Right, so he saw this as the, as the core business for all of mankind, is to make sure of their eternal life, right? And he, he even references humanity as being sons and daughters of death, right? We're all going to face it someday. Um, so therefore, the main goal, the chief business of every person is to ensure their eternal life in Christ, and he goes on to say, whether a man considers the immortality of his own soul, the ineffable joys and glory of heaven, or the extreme and endless torments of hell, the inconceivable sweetness of peace of conscience, or the misery of being subject to the terrors thereof, all these put a necessity, a solemnity, and a glory upon this work. Right? So he says, you know, if you consider the great joys uh, the great peace of heaven, or if you consider the extreme and endless torments of hell, let all of that provide necessity and urgency and solemnity and glory towards pursuing the work of making sure your soul is eternally secure in Christ. Right? I mean, it's just like he is just enraptured by this. And with it is to help others to get there through Christ, right? Um, but the last line here is really telling. He says, but oh, exclamation mark, the difficulties and the dangers of attending to it, right? So he was no stranger to these dangers. Um, but uh, I think the point is very clear as we look at his life. He didn't allow these dangers to sidestep him in any way. He persevered. Once again, that word perseverance is core in his life. Um, so we find at the end of his life, on his deathbed, friends and family hear him say his final words, and those final words were, I know it will be well with me. Uh, he persevered his whole life, and at the end of his life, there was an assurance that, you know what, it is well with my soul. Um, and may we be that kind of a people. May we be the kind of people that live our lives in such a way that at the end of our life, there's no question, right? There's no doubt. Will we make it to heaven? Will Christ um, be, be happy with me when I see him face to face in a few seconds? 
may we be a people who are diligent to persevere no matter what the opposition, no matter what the circumstances may look like, no matter what people's opinion of us may be. May we pursue the opinion of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords at all cost. And um, even as, I'll leave you with this, 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul speaking to young pastor Timothy says indeed, all who choose to be to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Right? It's it's an equal sign. If you choose to live godly in Christ, you will be persecuted. If you do this, that will be the result. And um, I think so many times in today's day and age, we uh, we try to sidestep the persecuted part. Right, uh, I, I wonder often if the reason why the church isn't as bold as it should be is because we want people to like us, when in fact we should be seeking the kingdom, uh, whether people like us or not. Amen. Um, and so, none model this better for us than the Puritans, right? They pursued the glory of God at all cost, and. Uh, and uh, gained a great prize because of it. And so it's my prayer, my wish for my life, for my church, that we be a people who will live this way, um, no matter what the cost may be. So anyway, that is, uh, I guess, a little bit of John Flavel's life. As I said, his writings are excellent, at least of what I've read. Uh, I would encourage you to pick up some of his works if you can. Um, good stuff, good stuff. It will be very encouraging for your life. Um, but say, uh, next week we begin a little bit of a rabbit trail journey, um, still sticking with the Puritans. But we're going to be taking about two months probably to study the great Puritan book, The Pilgrim's Progress. Um, this book was written by a man named John Bunyan, who was also persecuted. He spent two different time periods of his life in prison, one of which he wrote this book, The Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, the Pilgrim's Progress is all about, it's an allegory about the Christian journey towards the city of God. Um, and so it's just a great insight, gives a great, a lot of encouragement. So that begins next week. If you aren't doing anything, if you aren't already committed to another church um, activity, then please join us next week, beginning at 645 and on Wednesday night. It's going to be a great study and, and uh, very, very uplifting. So God bless you all. Have a great evening. Um, be careful out on the ice. <laughs>